So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Uh, first, we'd have a roll call. So, from Potomac State, how many do we have? I see one, Jerry, thank you. And I see four at Tech, is that correct? Yes. Okay, we have a quorum for today's meeting. So first on the agenda uh, for approval of the minutes of the February 8th Faculty Senate meeting. Um, these were distributed with the uh, annex, uh, with the uh, agenda. Uh, are there any corrections to those minutes? Hearing no corrections, the minutes are approved as written. Um, I think uh, President Guy has just arrived. Are you ready to present or would you like the provost to? Okay, so at this point I'm going to invite the uh, provost to come to the podium and give her report. Thank you. What a privilege. I'm going to steal all the president's remarks and then, <laughs> then he'll, be, he'll know what it's like to follow him. Um, that's not really true. I'm lying. Um, well, the, the first thing I think is important is to thank all of you who have celebrated with us uh, since the announcement of our uh, Research Highest Activity Ranking by Carnegie. For those of you who were able to come last week, we had an absolutely wonderful celebration and a great State of the, State of the University address, and I know Gordon will probably want to talk about that a little bit more, so I won't say more about it. Um, other than to say that there were really three pillars, um, well, maybe four pillars of the address. One is transformation. I think that that's important that there was an announcement that we're really going to work on transforming um, how we do our work and how we educate our students. But then there were three pillars of focus, education, health, and prosperity. Um, and everyone within the university, um, no matter what college you're in, fits within those three, um, but they are all focused on both what we do externally as our land grant mission, but also what we do internally um, in terms of uh, making our university the very best place it can be. Um, it's been a whirlwind of a month with so many good announcements uh, about what we've been able to do. Um, we are working on putting together um, SWAT teams to take a look at different areas of operations and figure out where we can enhance revenue with some of them and where we might be able to do some savings on others. Um, we have some academic SWATs going on where we're actually looking at where we might be able to enhance some programs and increase enrollment in particular programs. One of the things that uh, we recognize is that we often create new programs and then just steal from one another. Uh, among the colleges, and that's not what we want to do. What we want to be doing is the very best to be on the cutting edge of what's important and relevant to the world today and figuring out how we enhance enrollment in those areas. So um, any ideas that you have, please start them flowing in because we know there's a lot of wisdom in the crowd. Um, we're pushing ahead on um, working on our international programs, I'm calling it international education programs and research because we really are trying to think big about how we globalize. So you'll be getting more updates on that as we're able to make more progress. But for all of you who do international programs, you know right now we have a very decentralized model. It isn't serving everyone's needs very well and we're really going to work to reform that and make sure that we're going to be hitting on all cylinders in our international programs. For those of you who've had an opportunity to talk to Mindy Walls, you know that she's been working on entrepreneurship across all the colleges, and this is a really extraordinary model and very exciting. Obviously, we have a minor and a major in entrepreneurship in B&E, but what we want to do is we want to build a network for entrepreneurship education that flows across all of the colleges. And you may not realize it, but we've had it going on in a lot of colleges. We've got entrepreneurship in law, 
We've got it in Davis College, uh, Davis College of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Design, and I always get a point for saying the whole name. Um, and we have it, um, as I said, in B&E. Um, we have it coming out of Eberly. So what we need is to create a hub so that there's a tighter network and we're getting more bang for our buck. So Mindy Walls is working on that and it's going incredibly well. You may remember, or you may not, um, that we really are trying to focus on our corporate relations um, to improve the way in which we interact with our corporate partners. And that includes not only things like research, but it also includes things like placement of our students, um, which is very important, and being able to um, look at internships, careers, et cetera, bringing back some of our corporate partners to campus. And Cynthia Sweet, who is the head of our corporate relations, just launched the first event, which was at last week's, um, I guess it was last Wednesday's basketball game. And it was tremendously impressive. There were all these wonderful people there who have created uh, scholarships and have offered internships for our students and that's very, very exciting. One of the other meetings we had this week, and I see many faces uh, among you who were there, we had our big, uh, largest meeting of those who are interested in a Center for the Humanities and we made an announcement at that meeting that there will in fact be a Center for the Humanities and its initial funding will be a quarter of a million dollars for programming and for a director um, and for some support and we're able to do it for that amount of money because the library has stepped up to actually house it. And so this is a very exciting transition in how we think about supporting the humanities because the Center for Humanities will actually be in the library along with our digital publishing operation and with our press. And so it gives us a wonderful platform for the humanities. And speaking of the humanities, um, tomorrow is our inaugural celebration of all of the major works that have done, been done by our humanities and arts faculty it can be anything ranging from a book to an app to a performance, um, but it is tomorrow and it's our inaugural cele celebration of scholarship and we will be having it again next year. We hope this will be an annual event. For those of you in the STEM professions, um, don't worry, you're not being left out. We'll be doing the same thing for you, um, but we wanted to do something right away for this year because it is the 50th anniversary. Um, of the uh, endowments for the humanities and the arts. And as someone said, and I think it was you, Trevor, at the Center for the Humanities meeting, um, Trevor said something that really had a lot of impact, and it was that he's in STEM, but a lot of his work connects very much with the humanities, and he wants to make sure that the Humanities Center empowers all of us to be able to work across disciplines so that the humanities actually inform and strengthen what we're doing. And um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything, but no, that was okay. You're probably surprised I even remember, right? Um, but it was, it was a, a really, really profound statement and I think something that we all hope to get out of it. Um, so uh, that recognition tomorrow is very exciting. Um, the Honors College and Office of Undergraduate Research, how many of you are working with the Honors College in one way or another? Yeah, quite a, quite a few of you, and that's excellent. I want to thank you for that. It makes a huge difference. Um, the Honors College, along with the Office of Undergraduate Research, has developed a procedure to recognize faculty members who mentor undergraduates in research and creative endeavors. And nominations are being accepted until March 15th, and the awards are $1,000 awards, and they'll be made at the annual Honors College Recognition Ceremony. So a way of finally reaching out and recognizing those of you who are doing so much. And I want to give a shout out for Honors. They've really, really increased its enrollment, um, thereby continuing to raise the profile of, of the university, and that's a really big deal. Mediation training was last week. 20 people went to Ogilvy for mediation training. Apparently, it was a huge hit. Was anyone here go? 
one, per, one person in the back. So it was worth going, right, Jennifer? So um, we're trying to expand the number of mediators on campus so that we have a lot of options. Um, there are so many other things to announce, but I do want to say that we've had a couple of really big achievements. One is that Sally Hodder from Health Sciences, the Center for Translational um, Research, has been appointed to NIH's National Advisory Allergy and Infect Infectious Disease Council, which is a really, really huge deal. So um, shout out to uh, her for her appointment. We're really proud of that. And um, Liz and Ken Sfones Wolf have won the Organization of American Historians Award um, for their recent book called Struggle for the Soul of the South on Labor History. Um, and that's a wonderful recognition of their work. Dr. Michelle Richards Babb, I don't know if many of you know who she is, but she runs our undergraduate research programs. Along with Dr. Brian Pop, they just received $300,000 to support our undergraduate research. Um, and the undergraduate research program is one of the first things I saw as the provost. I was totally blown away by what our undergraduates are doing. So to have that extra support is great. And finally, two Statler professors won National Science Foundation Career Awards. Um, we're, we're really getting more and more of those, and they're very important. One goes to Jennifer Weedhaus, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Her work is to develop a rapid method for tracking hundreds of waterborne pathogens. And Slava Ackerman, is assistant professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering, earned the award to further his work on promotion and prevention of flame acceleration and transition to detonation. Um, I love these. Um, I know, it's great. So you're wondering, what I read was, who's trying to detonate what? You know, that was like my first question. What are we trying to blow up here? Um, but th that, I just wanted to share some of those great successes and where we're heading. Um, in terms of our plans. And then finally, I want to say that um, our panel for, uh, faculty panel for promotion and tenure um, met today and got briefed and oriented. Um, so we're heading into the promotion and tenure season and I want to thank all of you who've worked so hard to get everything in place for us to tackle. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm not going to say anything more because it's beautiful outside and I'm sure that we would all like to move quickly. So questions and answers, both from here and uh, Potomac State and Tech. Since you stole the president's spot, you also get to steal his question. What oh, do you no, know? you can save it for Well, him. he's, you know, I did want to ask you this too. Um, it's been troubling me all week, actually. So one of the many things that arose out of the author and environmentalist Mike Tidwell's visit here on campus last week was the opinion of some of our students that it's too, too late to do anything about climate change, that we're essentially doomed as a species to a speeded up extinction. And I wondered about that attitude, that hopelessness, that sense of hopelessness, and how it might be felt among our students not only as related to climate change, but say to economic disparities in our country where the rich are irrefutably becoming richer, the poor, poor, the middle class is vanishing, and a college diploma, yes, even from WVU, is no longer the obvious step toward fulfilling the American dream, but might be a high-priced gamble. And alarmingly, we're seeing a lot of hopelessness as manifested in despair and scapegoating and anger and rage in our national discourse. It hasn't really come here on campus, thankfully. But the question is, are our students in their right to feel hopeless about their futures? And if not, what are we doing as a university beyond educating them to offer them hope? Oh, it's such a great question. Um, let me start by saying I think there have been many history, many, many times in history, even in, in our lifetimes, when many of us felt there was no hope. Right? I mean, the, the atomic bomb was a time when people were absolutely terrified and certain that they were having children only to see their children suffer and die. Um, I think that um, you can look back further at World War 
at the world wars, for example, of times of hopelessness, times of deep recession, which in fact we have had, like the oil and gas crisis in 1973 when we had a very, very high rate of unemployment. So I think, I, I do think that there are times when we've had extreme hopelessness and we've come out of those times. I do not think it's unusual. I, for me, uh, I certainly experienced around at the potential for atomic destruction and then the Vietnam War. Um, I do think that particularly college students are very vulnerable to feelings of hopelessness. They're just beginning their lives and they don't have enough experience yet to have that sense of hopefulness that will make it beyond this. And so I think what you're saying is so incredibly important. And I take it as a responsibility to talk to our students about what is hopeful and particularly about education. Um, they may think that it's not much of a ticket to the middle class, but I can tell you every statistic that we look at, that bachelor's degree, whether it's from here or from somewhere else, means between 400,000 to a million dollars more in a lifetime of earning. And so they do have a sense, I think, of, you know, the, they feel a, a burden about their debt. They worry about being it, paying it off. But I think we've been very disturbed by public rhetoric, which focuses on can you pay it off right away, not can you pay it off after all of the years that your income is going up because of your degree. And we also don't talk about the richness of what it means to have been and had the opportunity to learn and engage and to live a much richer life and a life that has broader perspective. Um, I do think that we all have an obligation to talk our, to our students about those things. Um, programmatically, I hope that we do a lot on those things, both in terms of student life and on the academic side. But I would love to hear from people in the room, because I know we're all touched and moved by our students. If other people have ideas about what we can be doing, um, then we all ought to be talking to one another about what to do. I, I think there's no more important role um, in a, for a faculty member um, than to give hope where there isn't any to a student, because we can make such a difference in their spirit and willingness and confidence to go on. So thank you so much for that question. Very, very timely. Any other questions uh, here in Morgantown or Potomac State or Tech? I have a quick question. Okay, thank you very much. You're talking about that here research. Is this all? Thank you, Provost. And also and sources. I'd like to invite the President up to give his report. I thought I'm talking about Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, is some tech had a question? Okay. Uh, tech has a question for yeah. you. Great. Yeah, that was a question. Oh, the question was that undergraduate research office can be a resources for this campus as well. Could you repeat that, please? The undergraduate research office, which is in the main campus, can that also be a resource for this campus as well? I didn't understand. <laughs> I, if I heard your answer correctly, I think what you were asking is, are the resources and efforts that we're making in the Morgantown campus going to be available to our campuses at Potomac State um, and at Tech? Did I get your question correctly? Particularly related to undergraduate research office. I'm sorry, it's for some reason you're breaking up and I couldn't understand the last specific part. The undergraduate 
Oh, well, the undergraduate research office, is that what you're asking? Right. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, when, when the information comes out about students to apply for participation in the programs, and there are actually three different undergraduate research programs, we should make sure that the information is getting to the students, Potomac State and Tech, and make sure that they understand that they can also apply for the positions in these three programs. Thank you very much, and I'm going to be I'm going to be rather short. First of all, Mark, that's a that's a startling question. It's a great question. Um, I, I'd have to say, you know, after spending half my life on a university campus, I I would I would look at it through the other end of the telescope. I get great hope from our students, and I think that that is one of the that's one of the things that is most empowering about being who we are is the fact that. Uh, each generation does come with its own hope and, and they generate it. We have given them a mess, uh, particularly my generation. You're younger than me, but my generation has done a horrible job and we recognize that. But, uh, uh, but for some reason or other, I think that they tend to work this thing through um, and I think that we have a responsibility to take hope from them. You know, it's interesting, I, I've just finished a, a, a two books back to back. Uh, Joseph Ellis has written a series of great books on the revolution. and. Uh, and one is, uh, the, the one is um, on the first family, which is Adams, uh, about, about Abigail and John Adams, and the second is called the Quartet, about the four leading uh, folks uh, at that time, obviously Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and, uh, or Hamilton, and, and, and Adams. And, uh, and, and when one reads about them, who were our founding fathers, and the viciousness and mean-spirited nature of that uh, dialogue during that time, one thinks about this almost being as child play in some ways, and of course that was a very fragile time for our nation also. I do, I, I, n many of you know, and I've said this publicly, I do take great offense at the, at the political dialogue going in this country right now. Uh, this is not a political statement, it is a fact that we need to have mature people engaging in mature conversations, and uh, this is a perilous time. Um, for all of us, and we need to have that happen. So I'm. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate the question, but I. But as I say, I think that, I think that we can take great uh, pleasure from the, uh, uh, from the quality of the spirit of our students. We just need to give them the empowerment to be able to make those things happen that that, that they think are very important. I'll just focus on three things. First of all, I, I appreciate many of you being engaged in our um, in 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 our. Uh, special uh, State of the University uh, moment last week, which was particularly a, a celebration. I think it's great. You know, we, 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 need, to, we need to do two things. We need, to, uh, we need to celebrate more, and we also need to recognize more. I think, that, uh, I think that sometimes we spend a lot of time focusing on issues that are of concern, and they are of concern, but we have much to celebrate. In particular, I think this year we all recognize that we've had a great deal to celebrate. Uh, and I appreciate that. I, one of the celebrations we want to make, and I think this really addresses Mark's question, is the fact that this is the 15th year of the Promise Scholarship, which if you take a look at the data on the Promise Scholarship, for, you know, there's a Hope Scholarship in, um, in Georgia. There are a number of these uh, variations, but certainly for West Virginia, that scholarship has made an enormous difference in terms of ability to be able to have access to higher education, and we, we certainly want to uh, to, to acknowledge that and uh, make sure that we do recognize that. Um, we had a wonderful gathering. We brought a group of our faculty and students to, um, uh, to meet with a number of our donors in Florida because they were having a gathering there. And, uh, and I will tell you that uh, the quality of the presentations and the, and, and the impact that it has on our fundraising, on our visibility, on our ability to be able to tell her story was just remarkable. And I think the most important one was that Joyce, uh, along with Ken Blemings, had a, um, had a session with, with students, some of our, some of our students, uh, fairly randomly selected. And uh, their, their conversations about our university is something we should all hear. I think sometimes that we hear ourselves, we need to have conversations with our students about some of the things that they are doing and what their view of us is. I think we'd be gratified by that. And finally, I would just say that we are in the middle of a legislative session. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 uh, our tech bill, which has been our number one priority, has been uh, a pilgrim's progress, to say the least. And uh, it did pass the Senate today. Uh, there are a couple of minor amendments that will go back 
to the House. Um, but the one thing that I think is, uh, is of concern to me is the fact that those who, uh, who have spoken against the bill have spoken about it in terms of the integrity of the university. We didn't, uh, we didn't reveal, we didn't do a variety of other things. I think that, I think that um, we all know uh, that the only common currency the university has and those of us who lead it are, is, is really our integrity and, and trust. And so whenever that is uh, brought into question, we need to concern ourselves and we certainly uh, uh, take that very seriously. But I do believe that uh, that, that again, um, once we are in our new campus at Beckley will prove to be one of the singularly most important uh, uh, opportunities in higher education for the people of the state and it really addresses again uh, one of the questions that was raised earlier how do we get people to have access to the to to education how do we make that available we have to do it in a much different way than we've been doing now and this is clearly um, our approach to that so I'm grateful for that saying that what kinds of questions can I answer for anyone It's such a beautiful day. We ought to all be out there in the park or something like that. I, by the way, I want to complain to the provost. The reason I was late is the fact that the uh, is the road system doesn't work and the PRT is out of. No, just kidding. I want, I want you to know that there are those things. Talk to Narvel. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll talk to Narvel. But uh, but again, um, uh, it, it, I, I, I love the question because I gives a, I think it gives us a chance to think widely about the purpose of what we do every day. And I and I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. Have a great day. Thank you, President. So uh, next on the agenda is my report. Um, a few things for uh, uh, a few things to report on. Uh, first of all, the ESCI is moving. The, that process is moving forward. Um, the, currently, there are training sessions available. Um, if a specific department is interested in. Uh, getting IT to visit them to give them uh, an update or some training. Uh, they are well open to that. And if you're interested in that, uh, you should contact Jessica Thomas in uh, IT and she can arrange that. So uh, and there are several departments who have already done that. Um, the om Ombudsman um, search is underway. Um, we've met a couple of times, the committee w has met a couple of times, and uh, re recommendations will be forthcoming. Um, we are still working on the Faculty Senate website, although I think pretty much all the glitches are, are out. We're uh, still archiving a little bit of the information. Also note that the chairs, the photographs of the chairs, and also for the um, uh, Board of Governors representative from uh, Health Sciences and Extension have been added, so it's a little bit more complete now. Again, I'm not getting any feedback on it, so um, like I tell my students, that must mean that we've done a fantastic job, but I suspect that nobody is just responding. So if you have a question or a comment, please uh, feel free to email me about that. Um, as you noted, I think when you came in and from the handouts, the uh, Learning Commons is having their uh, sandbox open house on March 17th at the Evansdale Library. I uh, suggest that everybody tries to pop by there at some point in time. Um, I was there last year and learned a lot of things and I'll go again this year. So I think if you're interested in learning new techniques for the classroom, that's a really good um, place to start. Um, and lastly, nominations for the next batch of senators, so for uh, outgoing or incoming senators for next year, instructions about ballots were emailed last Friday, and I believe nominations end this Friday. So make sure you vote early and often, but only for people in your own constituency or college, okay? So you should have received an email. If you did not, uh, we need to know about that, but I, I haven't heard anybody who hasn't received that. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. I always get off light, that's good. So the next, next on the uh, agenda is um, announcement of the declared candidates and nominations for the Faculty Senate Chair-elect. That's gonna be for somebody serving starting in uh, July 2017. Um, based on the way we do things, that person will also be um, uh, 
a member of the Board of Governors for a two-year stint. So this is a, a fairly important um, uh, position. So the candidates that we have received so far are the following. Anne Cronin from the School of Medicine, Ed Nilsson Bernardes from the College of Business and Economics, Becca Fint Clark from Extension, Cindy Shockey from the School of Dentistry, Anne Lafasso from the College of Law, Nick Bowman from Eberly College, and Matt Valenti from Statler College. So at this point, I would ask, are there any additional nominations from the floor? Okay, so hearing none, I would ask for a motion to close the nominations for chair-elect. Is there a second? Uh, is there any discussion? I can't think why there would be, but... So hearing none, uh, all those in favor of closing the nomination, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, Potomac State, how do you vote? One aye. And Jennifer? Two ayes, okay, very good. And uh, Virginia, uh, West Virginia Tech? That's four eyes. So, thank you. And the nomination is closed. Um, I will be instructing um, those candidates um, about uh, how long they'll be given to present, give their stump speech at the April Senate meeting. Uh, it'll probably be, limit, be limited to two or three minutes, and I'll be a, a hard taskmaster since we have seven nominations. I want to keep it under uh, some reasonable time constraints. Um, I think it's, I, I guess I shouldn't be asking this aloud, but it's, I think it's also okay if the candidates prepare a written document that they... Um, or, Okay, so Alan will contact them regarding a written document sort of outlining the, um, uh, their background and their expertise and experience uh, in doing this job and why they obviously would want to run. Um, a similar process is going to take place for the new Board of Governors representative, which will be um, somebody either from the Health Science Centre or from Extension. Uh, that announcement will be posted by uh, March 28th by Alan, um, which will be immediately after the spring break. Nominations will be sought at that time, and I will ask for nominations from the floor at the April Senate meeting. And then following a similar process for the chair-elect, um, there will be oral presentations by those candidates at the May Senate meeting. So again, uh, be aware that that is in the pipeline. So are there any questions about the process? Okay, hearing none, um, I'm glad to uh, hand the meeting over temporarily to Matt Valenti, who's going to present a rather long list of uh, items from the curriculum committee. All right, thank you, uh, Richard. So the committee met on February 8th, and we had a productive meeting, as you can see from the agenda. Um, we had 89 courses proposed, and we approved 89 courses. We didn't roll back any, but we did have a week to work with the initiators to get them right and passable. Um, we had five course changes, uh, three capstones, 45 alterations, uh, three new minors, a new degree, a new major, and three program changes. So those are all on the agenda, uh, we'll work out an efficient way to get these uh, passed. Uh, before we get to that point, I wanted to make a few comments about KIM, the Curriculum Inventory Management System, used to be the Catalog Inventory or Course Inventory Management System. So um, <clears throat> KIM, uh, KIM is the official rep repository for all information related to courses. So that would include the course description, prerequisites, expected learning outcomes, and the syllabi. Uh, the problem is that the expected learning outcomes and syllabi are not yet in KIM for a vast majority of courses. Um, however, under, um, under Series 17, uh, we need to post the expected learning outcomes for our courses. So the question is, how are we going to get all that information? 
So uh, the committee is working with the registrar and administration and the units in an effort to collect this information. So you, you may hear from us about this further. Uh, we'll start with uh, general education courses, foundation courses, and importantly, and this has come up before, um, courses that are offered at multiple campuses. Um, so if a course is offered at, let's say, WVUIT and here in Morgantown, uh, we want to get the syllabus and expected learning outcomes and course description and put them into Kim, but they need to be a common uh, description. So uh, this will be an opportunity to harmonize across the courses, or across the uh, campuses. <laughs> um, is, there so, a is there a deadline on that? So we'd like to do this over the summer, <laughs> um, and there is a plan to do it over the summer, but uh, we'll see if this happens. Now, uh, I mentioned this uh, last time, we do have a moratorium in effect still. It, if a course is offered at multiple campuses, you can't or we will not be able to process an alteration or a change. Uh, and that's mostly because the descriptions at the different campuses most likely don't match. The prerequisites most likely don't match, so we need to get those to agree before we can change them. Um, so we hope to have, hope to have everything harmonized by as early as August so we can get the moratorium lifted, but we'll see. Okay. Um, and then, so one other thing, I had mentioned that we do have a new Kim form, okay? But I need to point something out, and this wasn't well, quite expected, but in hindsight, it's probably okay. Um, if you want to go in and make an alteration to any course, if the syllabus and expected learning outcomes are not in Kim, you will need to upload them. So even if you're doing something as minor as changing the, uh, the subject code or the course number or something like that, ordinarily in past years we didn't ask for any further information. Now we do ask for you to upload a syllabus and expected learning outcomes. And I think this is just an effort to try to get as many of this, you know, as much of this information available as possible. Okay. Um, but that's a, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. It's, it, it's hopefully a temporary inconvenience because hopefully fairly soon we'll have all this information in Kim and you won't have to upload it if you're making a minor alteration. Okay, so that said, um, we can move on to the items in the agenda. And we do have a lot of items here and they can be categorized into items for approval and items for information. So my question is how do you want to uh, go about uh, doing this? Well, let's, let's go through the four annexes first and then uh, then I think we can do the information items A through E in, in bulk and then uh, for the approval consent, A through D in bulk, if that's yeah. acceptable. All right. So we'll do six items. Um, so the first of which is the new courses report, which was Annex 1, which as I pointed out is a set of 89 new courses. Okay, so are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 1? So hearing none, all those in favor of approving Annex 1 say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Uh, Potomac State, how do you vote? One aye. Okay, two, two ayes there. We got one in, uh, we got Jennifer Merrifield in, uh, in Morgantown. And how do you vote tech? No, you check those four eyes. Four eyes from tech, thank you. So uh, the ayes have it, Annex 1 is approved. Okay. So the next item is course changes report, and there are five course changes in there. Okay, so same procedure. Are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 2? So Linda, is that a question or no? No question, okay. All right, so um, hearing none, all those in favor in favor of approving Annex 2, please say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Okay, Potomac State, how do you vote? One aye. Okay, okay that's two ayes. And uh, Tech, how do you vote? Then you take those four ayes. Four ayes from Tech, thank you. The ayes have it, Annex 2 is approved. Uh, Annex 3 is capstone courses report, so we have three capstones. Okay. Any discussion or points of, any <laughs> points of discussion or objections to Annex 3? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving Annex 3, please say aye. 
Those opposed say no. Potomac State, how do you vote? One aye. Thank you. Two ayes for Potomac State. And how do, how do you vote Tech? W Tech votes four ayes. Okay, WV Tech votes four ayes. Okay, so Annex four. Annex. Oh, so, so I'm sorry, so Annex three is approved. Annex three is approved. Annex four is the alterations report, which is a for information item. Okay. okay, so is there any questions regarding Annex four? So hearing none, Annex four is filed. Um, so now um, what we're going to do is have a for information consent agenda. Um, and so the items that are in here first is the medieval and renaissance studies minor. Now you may recall that one I held last time uh, to get some questions answered. I believe those questions have since been answered. So uh, we'll go ahead and put that forward. Um, there's curriculum changes for the PEAT major. Um, and there are three new minors in agricultural and natural resources law. Arabic studies and biomedical engineering. And uh, these are all for information items. Okay. So are there any uh, points of discussion or questions regarding these five items for information? Hearing none, then those five items are filed. And then finally, we have an approval agenda which includes a new degree in entrepreneurship and innovation, which will need to go before the Board of Governors. The other items do not. Uh, there's a new major in music therapy. And then um, there's some changes. Currently, sociology and anthropology are areas of emphasis within the same uh, major, and they're being split into two separate majors, a major in sociology and a major in anthropology. Okay, so this is a uh, consent agenda for approval. So is there any objection or points of discussion for those four um, programs in the consent agenda? So hearing no objections, those in favor of approving these four items, please indicate by saying aye. Those opposed say no. Potomac State, how do you vote? We have one eye from Potomac State. And WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has four eyes. Thank you, four eyes from Tech. So thank you, Matt, appreciate it. Um, next on the agenda is the uh, GE F committee report from Dave Hauser, but I believe there is no report this week, if that's correct. So we're going to move on to item nine. So it's my pleasure to invite uh, Tony Christian and Kimberly Zaff to the podium to uh, present um, some information about wellness. Thank you for this opportunity. I uh, wanted to share with you, uh, for the ones that do not know me, I'm Tony Christian. This is Kimberly Zaff. Kimberly is the Employee Wellness Manager at WVU. Uh, back in 2006, the Faculty Welfare Committee had asked Margie Phillips, who at that time was the Vice President of HR, what about creating an employee wellness position here on campus? So we employed Kimberly, and in 2007, we really kicked off employee wellness. And so we've been doing all types of different activities across campus. This, uh, here recently, Faculty Welfare invited us to come because they, they were getting a little bit confused. I think some people were getting information, some people were not getting information. So we were really trying to enhance communication across campus. Because um, we have several activities that have been occurring. Some employees knew about it, some did not. So what we have done, just to enhance the communications, just since we met with Faculty Welfare, is that we have worked with IT and we've created a listserv that can go out to all benefit eligible employees so we can make sure that everybody is receiving that information. 
Uh, Kimberly is still working through the website. She still communicates with all the worksite coordinators. We have about 80 plus coordinators across campus. What we were finding is that some coordinators were sending out the information, some were sending it out sometimes, so that's why we created the listserv for everyone. And then PEIA has also offered to work with the worksite coordinators to also provide information. So you might actually get the information three times, but it's better that you get over communicated than to not get communicated. So what was asked of us is to share with you what are a few things that employee wellness has done across campus. So I'd like to share that. I'm gonna ask Kimberly to do that. And then we're gonna to speak to you about something that's actually coming up very soon uh, with Healthy Tomorrows with PEIA to make sure that uh, you're right on task to complete something. So Kimberly, would you like to share a little bit about employee wellness? Thank you. I am very excited to have the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon and I'm hoping that you'll enjoy the beautiful day once you're finished with this meeting. Um, I pulled up the employee wellness website here for you to look at to the activities and announcements page. This gets updated monthly or more frequently and is the go-to place to find out what is going on in the month or upcoming. And as you can see, the first two items here are the Healthy Tomorrow's Initiative and the Walk 100 Miles in 100 Days. And that program is actually hosted by the wellness program of the WVU Health Sciences campus. However, it is offered to all of WVU as well as the Morgantown community. So if you have a worksite wellness coordinator, you'll probably receive some communications about that. And if you don't have a worksite wellness coordinator, there is an individual registration form that you can find here if you wanted to participate. That is an annual program, and I'm going to come back to the Healthy Tomorrows initiative. Some of the other things that you can find here are things that are available. We do have ergonomic assessments available through environmental health and safety. We have our faculty staff assistance program that provides up to three free visits per year per employee and any family member of the employee. Um, we do have CPR available through environmental health and safety. I have provided resources to what fitness opportunities we have in, available in the Morgantown area, as well as a listing of classes that are being offered on campus. So we have Health Sciences, Evansdale, and downtown locations where you can uh, sign up and take a fitness class. Some of them are during the lunch hour and some of them are after work. Some are more for stress reduction and flexibility and others are more for cardiovascular fitness and strength and conditioning. So you can feel free to contact me if you wanna find out what is up and coming in your area or if there's a particular format you would like to participate in. There is also an option to have a free 16 session class through PEIA if you have not yet used that uh, fitness benefit. So there is a link off of our fitness class page. If you have not yet used that opportunity and you would like to use it, you complete the information. As soon as we have the minimum number, we can look at creating a class that can come to your work site. Uh, the work site would need a suitable space and we would find the instructor. But that is something else that's available at the work site and many of the participants who have gone through it have enjoyed a lunchtime class and we've had yoga and Pilates primarily so that you don't have to sweat too much and then get cleaned up and finish off your work day. We also uh, partner with WVU Urgent Care to provide flu vaccination clinics on campus typically done in the month of October. We have different campus-wide programs that are hosted out of employee wellness, sent electronically, and that way it allows anybody, wherever they're located in the state of West Virginia, to participate in those campus-wide programs. If you have a worksite wellness coordinator, you can also have custom programs at the worksite. And here is where PEIA can provide their health promotion consultant to come to the work site to offer some of those custom programs. That health promotion consultant will also provide lifestyle coaching. 
We have piloted a program called the Work It Out Fitness Assessment. It was very successful and popular at One Waterfront. And if you have a worksite wellness coordinator, they can contact me to schedule this for your building. And what it is is an exercise physiologist will provide a fitness assessment, taking a look at your health history, medical history, and then sharing your test scores with you, creating a baseline program to start a fitness program, looking at resources that are available to you, whether or not you currently work out at a fitness facility or if all you're going to do is to try something in your home. And then down the road, six months later, you can come back for that reassessment. And those are available to PEIA and health plan members. Okay, we do periodically offer tobacco cessation um, classes. And again, those who are interested can fill out the form that's on that link. I'm gonna to skip to the next item. The PEIA Healthy Tomorrows Initiative is a three-year initiative. Presently, we are in year two, and there are certain criteria for PEIA PPB plan insured policyholders. So the policyholder must complete the Healthy Tomorrows screening and submit the completed reporting form to PEIA no later than May 15, 2016. And I'm gonna let Tony step in for a moment to talk about a, a partnership with WVU Urgent Care to help bring an opportunity to you as a policyholder if you have not yet had your screening. Thanks, Kimberly. Last year, the first requirement was to make sure that you at least identified a PCP. If you can remember, we put out 20 million blasts. We had about a 77% of the people that have the PEIA PPP plans actually put in a PCP. We thought that was wonderful. This year, you know, hopefully you, you know, you've filled that piece out, but this year, as Kimberly's getting ready to describe, is that there's now a, the next part, completing a Healthy Tomorrow's uh, form, which she'll go through all the detail. So what we did, we reached out to WVU Medicine and WVU Urgent Care to see if they would actually partner with us. For those employees that perhaps have not gone to your PCP to complete this Healthy Tomorrow's, could we help employees out with this? So we've actually, uh, we, we finalized everything last week. Um, that's why it's out now. However, what we found last year with the PCP, most people wait to the last two months to get everything done anyhow. So we're trying so hard to make sure that this is available for our employees. Where they will offer a screening, they're gonna do this Healthy Tomorrow's Form screening for you um, at, at the uh, Student Health Service site. And I'm gonna let Kimberly go through all the details of what all that will be required. But this is a wonderful relationship for them to step up and do this. To keep in mind, no matter who you listed as your PCP, you just need to make sure this form is completed or else you're gonna incur a $500 deductible cost. So last year it was your PCP, this year you have to have the PCP plus a Healthy Tomorrow's <coughs> form completed. So uh, WVU Medicine has graciously volunteered to do that every day. So we're talking Monday through Friday, they're gonna do screenings every day for employees through uh, May the 11th. Kimberly, you wanna talk about the different? Okay, so year two of the Healthy Tomorrow's three-year initiative requires that we have an annual wellness visit, sometimes called a physical. It is at no cost, however, and I've had this come up at some of the presentations I've given, if you have other items addressed at the appointment, so as an example, if you mentioned that you had an earache and then you had some follow-up care related to that, that could um, incur additional costs with copay, deductible, and so forth. Um, the PEIA screening that urgent care is going to provide is really to make it quick and easy for those who have not yet completed the screening. You get, you get in, you do have to fast, the appointment will take about 10 to 15 minutes. You will have um, a resting blood pressure assessment. You will have blood work 
and with that blood work, they're going to take the fasting glucose value, so the blood sugar value, and the fasting total cholesterol value. And then the last item they're going to do is a waist circumference measurement. Those are the items that are required on the PEIA reporting form. All fields on the form have to be submitted, and the form does have to be signed by someone at the facility. So if you are going to go to your own primary care provider, it does not have to be the physician to sign the form, but it does have to be somebody within that um, office to sign the form. Some offices will mail the form on your behalf. You may want to ask for a copy to keep for your personal records or keep that copy for yourself and then mail one into PEIA. Okay, questions on that? Everybody, oh, yes. Could you go to the mic and just announce who you are, please? Wagner Benedito from Davis College. Um, my question is only the, the, the employee has to, to sign or also the dependents of the employee? The, only the policy holder uh, must complete the reporting form. However, any covered dependent is entitled to have their annual wellness visit. So they can also go and get their annual visit. And there are several items um, that can be completed and it's based on gender and age as to what you're entitled to at that appointment. If it is truly just a wellness screening, it should be no cost. Other questions related to the Healthy Tomorrows? I had a question. Um, so is there a way that you, is there a website that you can go to to check to see if um, the Healthy Tomorrow's information has been logged with PEIA? So I mean if you have a physical and wh what recourse do you have if your doctor forgets to fill the form in? I mean what do you do in that situation? What I have been suggesting when I've talked to employees throughout the campus is to make sure you have your own copy that you keep in your own medical records so that if, for instance, PEIA um, claims that they have not received it, that you can still provide that copy. Um, there is no system that I know of at this point in time that you can log in to see that it's verified. However, PEIA has not yet rolled out their open enrollment system that we use where we'll go in. That's where you would name your primary care provider. And um, I have heard that they may have a system for us to be able to upload the form into that system. However, there's nothing that's been put in writing to us to know that that is going to be a method we can use. So I strongly encourage you to keep your own copy mail a copy to them, and then you still have your own copy on file if you should need it. Other questions? Can I just make one comment? If you're going to WVU Urgent Care, WVU Urgent Care will upload your results into the WVU My Chart, so that information will be maintained already in your chart. They will be mailing the forms for you on your behalf. They're going to mail every Friday. Um, so they're going to collect them, they're going to be the ones responsible, they're going to overnight them to PEIA. So, because what will happen is that they're going to complete the form, they've got to wait for the lab results, they'll finish out the form, and then they're going to mail them on your behalf. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have, I have a question. So, one of the items involved blood work, and it was for cholesterol and for gl glucose level. Um, if you were to do the multiphasic test at the health fair, you know, at the mall, could you use those results? What I, and I did the very same thing. I actually took mine to my primary care person. I just took those lab results and they filled out the form, just used those results from the multiphasic testing and I just mailed in the form. I mailed it in, made sure I had a signed receipt for mine, just as an FYI. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. One other thing. Oh. One more quick question. Uh, Jennifer Orlikoff, Everly College of Arts and Sciences. Does this also apply to health plan uh, patients? No, it is only for PEIA, PPB insured policyholders. One of the things I wanted to note, just to follow up on your question, is that where you came and checked in and got your name tag, 
You can pick up a handout if it applies to you and you still need to complete the screening. This is an informational flyer that talks about the process that WVU Urgent Care at the Health um, and Education Building only, so on our Evansdale campus, how they will process you through. They will also have you create the MyWVU chart login and your results will be put into that system so that if you access it, you can print them at any time. Yes? I probably have missed it, but where do you get the form? The form is available on PEIA's website. It is also available as a link off of our employee wellness website as well as the employee benefits website. And I'll use that as a segue to the PEIA website. They have information about the requirements of all of the years. So we're, we're in year two. We have to complete the screening and submit the form to PEIA. And then in year three, that will change slightly where they're going to actually look at the values on the report form. And our goal is to be within their reference ranges with the values that they're looking at and they are not including waist circumference measurement. So it will only be resting blood pressure, fasting glucose, and fasting total cholesterol. And I promise you, you'll see lots of emails going out in e-news and listservs because we're sending these out constantly. This is what the report form looks like. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much. Appreciate the update. And uh, I guess if you haven't had your physical, better start looking around, right? Um, so next on the agenda is uh, Roy Nutter with the ACF report. Roy Nutter, Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources, and your ACF rep. Um, Legislature has been busy, as I'm sure you know. Um, I don't see that there's been much we need to pay attention to right now. President Gee mentioned that the tech bill, I wasn't clear what happened, but it sounded like it was amended in Senate today because he said back to the House. So we'll have to see what happens with that. The next week, for certain, we need to be paying attention to budget. Remember, West Virginia has a balanced budget bill, which means they either have to raise the amount of income or lower what we spend. So we'll see how that works out this week. That's my report. Any questions? Oh. Actually, a follow-up to the PEIA, I mean, they just, they nixed the tobacco tax increase. So what that means that we're, PEIA is in a $120 million shortfall, is that correct? Or PEIA could dump all of that back on us, and we would owe that. When the governor's budget came out, he had it kind of fixed, but what they've done since then is destroy all that, so we'll see it's not the same now. So. If you had to stop today, our PEI bill, PEIA bills will go up today. We'll have to see what happens by the end of the week. Thank you, Roy, for that sobering news. Um, so next on the agenda is Bob Griffith, who I do not see, which is a shame since he was going to give the uh, Board of Governors report. And since I was at the Board of Governors, I guess I should give the report. What? Yeah, I know you're pointing at me. Unfortunately, I only figured this out about three minutes ago, so it's going to be a pretty short report. But um, the f four of the sort of important things, I think most people know about this, but uh, four of the big sort of issues that were discussed. One was the announcement that Sean McWilliams was part of a team who basically uh, discovered the existence of gravitational waves, so that w went down obviously very well. Um, there was a report, uh, again, I think uh, this is well known, that the Volkswagen emissions team that had uncovered the, um, the issue with the Volkswagen diesel um, uh, scandal 
had been awarded a Disruptor of the Year Award by a CNET Roadshow, which uh, got a lot of national press. Uh, there was a new PhD in forensics that was approved, and the uh, Department of Chemical Engineering is now the department, or will soon be known as the Department of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering. And then there was um, a report about the applications, undergraduate applications, which are uh, up by something on the order of 25% this year. So that's uh, encouraging, and that's, I think, um, uh, due to a concerted effort by, uh, to improve that. So they are the sort of main issues that were brought up at the Board of Governors. Uh, any questions on any of those? Okay, so hearing uh, none, uh, next up is Dr. Jennifer Orlikoff with um, a approval, item for approval for a preferred name policy. So Jennifer. Good, okay, it's on. Uh, We've seen this before, but I wanted to uh, bring your attention to a few changes. One is that uh, this time we have made it open to all students upon uh, review by the registrar so that anyone who does feel the need to have their name changed, they can do this officially through this vehicle, although in fact this is really intended for uh, students in the transgender population as well as um, international students who who want to have uh, a different name that they're associated with on, on rosters. The other piece that's also of interest here is that we have a time frame in place. Uh, John Campbell and his team have agreed that we can have this all up and running by fall of 2017. He says the, the biggest hurdle is eCampus, but he can get that squared away by fall of 2017. So, um, so you've all seen or you've all been, uh, um, have access to a copy of Annex 5, which is the preferred name policy. So are there any objections or points of discussion about this? I, I hear the sunny weather calling. So um, if there are no objections, all those in favor of approving Annex 5, please indicate by saying aye. Those opposed say no. Okay, Potomac State, how do you vote? One vote, one vote. Okay. And WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech votes four eyes. Okay, thank you. So the eyes have it and Annex 5 is approved. So is there any new business? I have a, well, I don't have a piece of new business. I have a, just a, something to think about, okay? I don't want any action on this, but we have got to the situation now where I think we're pretty well set on implementing this new SEI system. And uh, that will be sort of go in effect at the end of the semester and basically it's just replacing the old system except it's all electronic and, and uh, you know, we finally moved into the 20th century on this. On a, on a bigger issue, there is this whole idea of what the SEI should do and what does it do and what does that information give us and do we need 23 questions from students to actually figure this out. So I'm putting up for a th something to think about is that I would like to see some discussion on this, either in the Senate or an ad hoc committee or something, is first of all, you know, what does this information actually tell us? Is there an easier way to do this and could we do this by asking a lot fewer questions and would it be more meaningful if we did? So I would like you all to think about that on your way home while you're having a... a a nice walk in the sun, etc., and see if we can come up with a, a maybe a better way of doing this. This is in no way detrimental, trying to be detrimental to all the hard work that's been done on the SEI committee. But to me, it seems like this is a very unwieldy process to evaluate how people, how well people teach. So I think that would be a something to think about. 
and I have elicited a question, all right. <laughs> no, just more new business. Okay, please go ahead. I wanted to know if the, um, the Marianne Downs School of Medicine, I wanted to know if there was a way that we could make it more available for faculty members to use computer systems on different campuses. I know when I've been on trainings downtown campus, I can't get in the computer system. Uh, faculty members who have joint appointments can't get into the computer system to even present their own lectures when they go when they were presenting on a different campus than their own. Uh, good question. I have no idea, but I think John Campbell is the person to talk to. So I'll be more than happy to relay that question to him and see if there is a simple solution to that problem. It should be. Yeah, I would think <laughs> it should be a no-brainer, but. Yes, Tracy, maybe Tracy has an answer. Tracy Beckley with the Teaching and Learning Commons. Um, if it's an iDesign classroom, one of our technology-enabled classrooms, anyone should be able to log in with your regular login ID credentials. So please see me after the meeting and we can try to figure out what's going on. But those credentials should work globally as far as I know. And we no longer uh, lock the lectern, so. Okay. Uh, let's let's talk. Let's see if there's something we can do because I'm not sure why that would be the case. But yeah. Jessica, yeah. did you want to answer that or? So you're, you're speaking about the classroom itself or in the computer lab, like the ITS resources? Both of them. Okay. So in some of the computer labs, like in Waterfront, it's set up so that you don't have to log in um, because we have people from externally who come for training. And in those cases, you shouldn't need to log in. But if it is any of the WVU managed resources, especially the classrooms, it should sync to your MyID. And if it's not, or no longer MyID, to your login credentials, um, and if it's not, just we can we can help you through the help desk or Tracy yeah, can help you. On the room, but it just seems like a wider problem than just I have. Anybody else have that? Well, maybe we have a maybe you can have a sort of uh, conversation after the the meeting. But I think the idea is if you've got a specific case where it didn't work, you know, let's use that as a base point and see if we can move forward from there. Is there any other new business? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second? We are adjourned. <laughs>